Well, good morning and welcome to our virtual life group lesson, the Truth Casters class for Sunday, June 13th. And you may be asking yourself, why is this crazy man filming in a stairwell? Well, today we're talking about being steadfast in difficulties. We have talked the last two weeks about the reality of Christianity, that Jesus did not paint us a rosy picture and explain to us that being a Christian would be simple and easy. In fact, Jesus explained to us more than once that being a Christian, a true Christian, a true follower of Christ would actually bring some difficulties into our lives. He told us we would have problems, that we would be hated because he was hated, that we would be mistreated because he was mistreated. And that is not to discourage us, but as we discussed last week, Jesus Christ always deals in reality and honesty. And so he was very honest with us about what life would be like here on this earth. Many of us have not really experienced a lot of persecution. We may not have experienced um, tribu tribulations and difficulties because of our faith, but as we get closer to the end of human history, I believe that there will be more persecution. But you also have to keep in mind that there are many Christians in other countries who have suffered greatly, even while we here in America have had relative comfort. So we need to be praying about these things, and we're going to study this today in Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. Now, last Sunday, we looked at the letter that Jesus sent to the church at Ephesus. Today, we look at the letter that Jesus dictated to the church in Smyrna. And so we're talking about being steadfast in difficulties and that we have no reason to be afraid because we live in God's grace. And so I want us to break right into Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I want to stop right there and unpack verse 8. First of all, you have to understand that he is writing to a real literal church, a real body of believers that were in a real town called Smyrna. That town has a different name but still exists on the map today. And they were being persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ. They were being mistreated for the simple fact that they were followers of Jesus Christ. It sounds so crazy. It sounds so ironic that when you find the truth about God and you find the truth about life and you accept the reality that the only way for me to have life after this life, the only way for me to have eternal life in heaven is through Jesus Christ and yet the world wants to punish you for making that realization. And yet that is the reality because the prince of this world doesn't want you to have eternal life in heaven. He wants you to have eternal life in his hell. And so he doesn't want you to find Christ. And he wants to do anything to discourage others from finding Christ. And to discourage you from trying to share Christ. All of these things are the reality that the church at Smyrna was dealing with. And so Jesus writes to encourage them and to tell them that he, and he is the first and the last. You see this many times in scripture. Sometimes in the Greek, uh, he refers to himself as the Alpha and Omega, which means the first and the last, the beginning and the end. What did he mean when he said, I'm the first and the last? Well, generally speaking, we say, well, Jesus was just trying to tell us that he's everything. But more specifically, remember what we've learned about this great plan of redemption, that this great plan began with a savior before we were created before we existed before the plan was put into place the savior was chosen 
Jesus Christ is said to be the lamb who was slain from the foundations of the earth. Remember, God lives outside of time and space. He is not restricted to a particular space. He is not restricted to this moment in time. So when he says it, when he looks at the entire plan, he sees the whole thing, all of human history, as if it were laid out on a map. And he simply can say, yes, this is where it started from human point of view, but from God's point of view, it, it was already done that Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundations of the earth. It was already a done deal because it was decreed to happen. But what we need to understand is that when Jesus says, I'm the first and the last, the beginning and the end, not only is he the savior from the very beginning of the plan, he is the judge who wraps up the ending of the plan. He started it, he will finish it. This is the thing I have said to you many times. People love Jesus the Savior. They love Jesus who's always been there. They love Jesus who said, oh, love your neighbor. Oh, don't judge unless you want to be judged. They love that Jesus with the warm fuzzies, go and sin no more. What they don't love is the Jesus who's coming back in power and glory to judge the world. I've seen this meme many times on social media where people are talking about their sin and they're saying, you know, only God can judge me. And somebody else responded, that should scare you to death because God will judge you. The world will be judged by Jesus Christ. And that's the Christ that people don't really love. But we as believers need to hold on to that. And so the church here at Smyrna, when they are being persecuted because of their faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus is reminding them, hey, this is me talking to you. I am the first and the last. I started this. I will finish this. I know everything that's going to happen between then and now. I know the playbook. I know everything that the devil's going to do. I know everything he's going to throw at you. I know everything that's going to happen to you. There are no surprises from me. That's a comforting thing to realize. You may be surprised at what happens to you tomorrow. Jesus is never surprised. So the Savior and the judge is writing to them, and he is reminding them that he died and came to life again. Why does that matter? Because as I've said to you before, the worst possible thing that Satan can do to me is kill this body. He can't kill my soul. He cannot eradicate me from history. He cannot do that. He could, if God allowed him to, kill my body, destroy it. And immediately, I will be in the presence of Jesus Christ. And at some point, my body, which had been destroyed, will be resurrected put back together in a glorified form because God will save me, mind, body, and soul. Total salvation. And so Jesus is reminding them, don't be afraid of what happens to your body. Don't be afraid of what people do to try and hurt you or persecute you because of me. I've got this. I've conquered death. I've proven to you that I can take care of all of these things, I certainly can take care of your physical body. So look with me at verse 9. Jesus continues and says, I know your afflictions. That's what we just talked about. He knows the playbook. He knows exactly what's going to happen. He says, and I know your poverty, yet you are rich. I wanted to share with you a little bit of things that I have learned about Smyrna, just in some historical research, Smyrna was, of course, part of the Roman Empire. And in the Roman Empire, most people were encouraged to treat Caesar, the emperor, as if he were a demagogue or some kind of a semi-god, whatever you might want to call it. He would be uh, worshipped to some degree. 
And so Christians were often persecuted because they couldn't worship anybody other than God Almighty. And so they didn't want to worship Caesar or treat Caesar as if he were some kind of a god. You actually have some countries in the world today where the leader is supposed to be revered and treated as such. And I find it such a strange thing, but I've seen documentaries where people have photos in their home of their leader and bow down to it, kiss it, um, pray to it uh, because they're, in, they're told to by their government or lest they be persecuted. And so you have Christians here in Smyrna, they're saying, no, we bow down to God. We bow down to Jesus Christ. We don't, we don't worship Caesar. We will respect him as our political leader, but we're not going to worship him as being some kind of deity. Well, that created persecution. And then, of course, they didn't want to worship all the other gods that the Romans worshipped, all of the fake gods and all the fake temples. And they didn't want to give contributions to all of those temples. And they didn't want to buy the trinkets and all of the things that were sold to support all of those false gods in their worship. So they would be persecuted. They might not even get a job because the trade guilds might... Uh, not allow them to participate. It'd be like the union saying, you can't be part of us, therefore you cannot get a union job, period. You're not going to be able to make a living here in Smyrna. And so Jesus is acknowledging you're impoverished because you've chosen me. You've chosen spiritual truth over material goods and you're suffering financially because of it. He says, but I know your afflictions and I know your poverty, yet you are rich. He goes on to say this, I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Well, Smyrna also happened to have a large Jewish population, not Jews who had become Christians, but were still practicing Judaism. Now, Judaism in the Old Covenant was not a synagogue of Satan. That was God's religion under the Old Covenant. But it was expected that now that the Messiah has come and fulfilled the law and fulfilled the Old Covenant and instituted a new one, it was assumed that the Jewish people would understand now is the time to accept Christianity, to follow our Christ, our Messiah. And yet... Most Jews had rejected Jesus Christ. Now remember, we've studied this. They had the prophecies to recognize Jesus when he showed up. They had the prophecies concerning his birth and his life and all of those things. But the book of Daniel even gave them a timeline, a, a window in history where Messiah was supposed to show up. So the leaders, the elders, the ones who knew the Old Testament, the ones who knew the Bible, would have been able to recognize this is Messiah. He not only is here at the proper time, but he also fits all of the prophecies. He fits all of the scripture, and he's saying exactly what Messiah should be saying. He's our Messiah. We as a nation, as a people group, are going to follow him but that's not what happened. They recognized and knew he was the sent one, the chosen one. They didn't like him. He was not what they wanted. So they told the people, he's not the guy. They confused people and they pushed people to reject Christ Jesus. So what the Bible is acknowledging, what Jesus is acknowledging is not a damnation over the Jewish nation, but what he's saying is, for those Jews who rejected the Messiah they've been praying for for centuries, they have chosen Satan's way over Christ's way. And so by default, by rejecting Christ Jesus, they have now become the enemy. I mean, with God, there is no in-between. There's no such thing as being neutral. There is no Switzerland, spiritually speaking. You are either on God's side or you're against God. There, there is no in-between. I've said it so many times and I still believe it. You're either pointing people to God 
or you're pointing people away from him, one or the other. And Jesus is simply making that distinction here. And he's telling you, look, I'm sorry that there are all of these Jewish people there who are free to worship in their way. Remember, the Romans allowed the Jewish people to keep their religion. They didn't necessarily expect the true Jews to have to bow down to Caesar. They get an exception because they were allowed this. This was part of the, oh, the whole thing that was going on at the time that Jesus was walking around in Israel and was crucified. There was this uneasy alliance there between the Roman Empire and the Jewish leaders that basically if you just keep, keep people under control and don't try to put up any kind of insurrection against Rome, we'll leave you folks alone, let you have your little temple, have your little worship stuff, have your little priests, have your little leaders. You get to keep that and do what you want to do. Just stay out of trouble. And so here in Smyrna, you have this group of Jewish people who are still following the old way, but have rejected Jesus Christ, but they're not being persecuted by Rome the way the Christians are. But what Jesus is saying is that the Christians are being persecuted by the Jewish believers because remember what Saul, before he became Paul, he thought that these Christians were nothing but a cult, something that should be snuffed out and destroyed because they were corrupting people. So this is what the believers in Smyrna are up against. They're between a rock and a hard place. They have nobody else and they have nowhere else to turn. But Jesus is reminding them, I know your afflictions. I know your poverty. I know what you're dealing with, but don't be afraid. I wanted to read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And I wanted to read verses 3 through 10. This is a long little passage, but I want you to listen very closely to what Paul wrote to, his, uh, to the church in Corinth there in his second letter to them. He says, We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech, and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. Now, how can Paul say such things? How can Paul put together a laundry list of trials, tribulations, persecutions, difficulties, distresses, and then turn around and say, we've been beaten but not killed, dying but yet we live happy, poor but rich. How can he say such things? I mean, it sounds so convoluted and so backwards. He's saying it because he is recognizing, remember, this is Paul who said, I was the chief of sinners. This is Paul who said, I was shown mercy because of my great ignorance. But this is not the time for ignorance. This is the time for intelligence. This is the time for knowing. This is the time for understanding. 
This is the man who realized how badly he had persecuted Christ himself because Christ on the road to Damascus confronted him and said, why do you persecute me? And he realized that he had been persecuting the very Son of God Almighty. He had been persecuting the Messiah that was sent to save him. He realized that he needed grace in abundance and he had been given it and he was grateful for it and he never stopped being grateful. So when he was beaten, he didn't go to God and say, I can't believe you let this happen to me. When he suffered, when he was stoned, when he was run out of town, when he was put in prison, he didn't get mad at God and say, I can't believe you've done this to me. I can't believe you've let this happen to me. Because he realized that this was temporary. And he realized that he was one day going to go be with, with Jesus. And he talked about how fabulous that was going to be. And how excited he was, was to get there someday soon. But he also recognized, but if right now I need to be here to lead other people to the truth. Okay, that's fine with me. Let me do it. That's an incredible attitude. And that's what Jesus is reminding the church of Smyrna of. I know you've been through some stuff. And I know you're going through some stuff. But so have I. Jesus is reminding them, but I died for you. I've been through all that. I can identify. I can relate. So I want you to consider some of the other things that he said. Look at verse 10. He says, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He's telling them, I know what the devil has in store for you. I know the devil's plans. There's nothing that I'm going to be surprised about, but I'm holding you. I've got you. Uh, you don't have to worry. It may not be pleasant, <clears throat> but I'm going to be with you. I have to read something else to you. This, to me, is just really incredible. From Hebrews, I want to look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men. Now, he's, who's he talking about? He's talking about Christ. Consider Jesus who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I think the word sinful men, that phrase there is quite important because who are you being opposed by? Who is opposing you? If God were opposing you, then you would have serious reason to be quite upset and concerned and worried. But it's not God that's opposing you. If it were really good men who were opposing you, that might be pause for concern. That might make you stop and think, am I really doing the right thing if good people are opposed to me, even though good people can be wrong? What he's saying is you are being opposed by sinful men. In other words, their opinion doesn't count. When somebody who is very unattractive picks on you and calls you ugly, please consider the source. When somebody who is full of sin looks at you and says, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't understand spiritual things. Consider the source. You don't have to be ugly to people. But what Jesus is reminding us and what the writer of Hebrews is reminding us uh, Jesus was not opposed by good people. Jesus was opposed by sinful men. Sinful men are always opposed to truth. Sinful men are always opposed to righteousness. Sinful men are always opposed to spiritual maturity. Sinful men are always opposed to people coming to a knowledge of Jesus Christ and, and, and going to eternity in heaven. So when you're opposed by sinful 
ungodly people, don't be afraid. Don't be concerned. In fact, one last passage from... Let's see if I can find where I posted this here. 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Peter wrote something here that I wanted to read to you. He says in verse 12, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering. Do you see a pattern here in the Bible? Do you see a pattern in the New Testament of don't be afraid and don't be surprised when you suffer and don't be surprised when bad things happen and don't be surprised when you are persecuted and don't be surprised when you are distressed? Do you see the pattern? Jesus deals in reality. This deals in reality. We're never told that it's going to be a walk in the park. We're told that Satan will oppose us because we are uh, sowing seeds of truth. But look what Peter said. Don't be afraid or don't be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. In other words, he's saying, don't think this is strange or odd. This is normal. This is what Jesus told us to expect. He says, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. I wanted to share one little thing with you. I want you to consider this letter to Smyrna. Jesus didn't have anything critical to say about them. He was very pleased with them. Even though they were going through some difficult times, even though they were being persecuted, their lives were not easy because of him. They weren't doing anything wrong that he called them out on and said, I have this against you. He was quite pleased with them and told them so. That, I think, is the heart of Peter's words when he talked about the Spirit of God resting on you. I want you to just stop for a moment and consider what that means to have the Spirit of God it's not that the Spirit of God needs rest from work, but resting as in positioned upon you, as if you are carrying upon you this Spirit of God. This is what being a Christian is all about. Being that person through whom the peace of heaven is exhibited and displayed in a chaotic world. The world is full of chaos because of sin, because of the fallen nature of humanity. And yet as Christians, we are called, even though we live physically within that chaos, to spiritually rise to the level of peace. This is why Jesus talked in his Beatitudes about bringing peace, that ultimate spiritual maturity makes you an arbiter of peace because the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, rests upon you. And so he's telling this church at Smyrna, don't be afraid. He's telling you and I, no matter what we may face in this life, don't be afraid. I've already lived through all of it. And truthfully, he's lived through far worse than we could. And yet what he's telling us is, but I'm always there with you. My Holy Spirit can literally rest upon you. And you will be blessed. You will be a beacon of peace in a stormy, chaotic world. Let's pray about that. Our dear Father, we thank you that you love us enough to want to use us, to want to use us to bring peace to the world. Father, we thank you for that, and we pray that you would help us to be a light, to be a beacon, 
into this lonely, chaotic world that surrounds us, Father. Help us to spread the truth of Jesus Christ amongst all of the lies that are being told. Father, help us to bring peace. Lord, we love you and we thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. And I want to thank you once again for joining me today, and I look forward to seeing you again next Sunday.